everyone? Can you all, all hear me in the back? Excellent. Um, so as our talk says, uh, GPU accelerating UDFs uh, and PySpark with Numba and PyGDF. And so I just want to give a quick background, and then Keith's going to talk more about uh, the implementation of this. But the, the data struggle is real. Data is growing rapidly. Um, and, and one of the things that we're seeing is people want to start doing more elaborate analysis of their data. And this is just a really great use of GPUs, is when you start to have more data and you really want to start doing things in parallel, the GPU is an ideal hardware for it. And as we've seen over time, uh, GPU performance is continuing to grow, while CPU performance is starting to plateau off. And so another thing to talk about is while data is growing, so are data formats. And so we're seeing just this kind of proliferation of ways in which you can store your data. Um, there's Pickle, there's CSR, there's HDFS, there's Avro, Parquet, so forth and so on. <clears throat> and so with all these different data formats, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we actually pipeline our data. And so data engineering is also a, a challenge because data comes in in a certain format and you want to do analysis in another format and another system might have uh, that data, um, it's in memory representation of that data in a completely different format. And so we're spending time not only trying to analyze this volume of data, but trying to make sense of this myriad of different data types. And so the data processing evolution kind of started um, with the parallel computing movement, the Hadoop. And so you basically would just read a bunch of data in from HDFS, query it, write it back out, read it, do something else, write it back out, and so forth and so on. And one of the things that really showed uh, like a lot of promise in Spark was just leaving it all in memory. And so one of the things that Spark does is you pull data into memory, and then you can just do a chain of different things. As long as you have enough memory, Spark is just really optimal, and you get these really great uh, performance increases, as well as this like flexibility of, of code and, and, and programming paradigms. Um, and, and that's really exciting. And so this is um, kind of like Spark's usage back from 2016 from uh, Katie Nuggets. Um, and just kind of a, a, a chart of all the whole uh, Apache Spark ecosystem. And so Spark really just becomes synonymous with big data. Um, and then it's also become kind of the glue of the big data ecosystem. And so as Spark has grown and started to add in more components, um, there's really five main things that Spark does. Um, Spark has a streaming, um, a SQL engine, a machine learning library, the GraphX library, and then this idea of an RDD. But Spark is not enough. And so this chart is showing um, a, a simple uh, SQL query in Spark. Uh, and what we're, really, really, what we're noticing really quickly is we're getting bandwidth um, or, or bottleneck by the CPU. And so memory isn't the bottleneck. It's literally just compute. And so just trying to do uh, this you know, really small aggregation, we see that all 20 cores of this system are just getting completely maxed out. And so while Spark is growing um, in use and is growing in ease of use, um, and they're doing all these other different things, one thing that Spark isn't focused on is adding other hardware coprocessor acceleration. And so these slides are actually from Databricks. And so there's you know, nothing wrong with what they're doing. They want to make Spark easier to use. They want to make Spark faster. Um, they want to uh, add more functionality. but they're just not focused on uh, GPUs, FPGAs, et cetera. And that's just the direction of, 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 of Databricks and Spark itself. And that's something that we felt was a limitation. We wanted to allow people to uh, use this rich environment of GPUs while still kind of maintaining their existing tools. And so uh, a few months back, I think maybe in February, uh, there was a blog um, for one of the Azure teams about using Numba and Spark um, and moving workloads to the GPU. And basically on a, a K40, uh, so half of a K80, it's all about a 5x improvement um, just by uh, writing these UDS from Spark. And now, how they were doing this was a, a lot of serialization of data. Um, and this example is pretty limited. But what it's showing that is like this is something that people are starting to grow interest in, and it's doable. And so let's talk more about GPUs. Um, this is a, beer, uh, sorry, a query performance from MapD versus some other uh, hardware's Redshift and Spark. And what we're seeing here is um, you know, a query that takes minutes, um, you know, in, in the case of query four, um, a minute and a half. We're seeing this in sub-second time 
on four GPUs or uh, eight GPUs. Um, and this is even something that would take six nodes of Redshift, uh, still about a half a minute to complete query four. Or sorry, three seconds to complete query four. My apology. And one of the things we're seeing is when we can move these workloads to GPU, with just a smaller footprint, we can just get more done. And the same thing with machine learning. Um, here's um, a benchmark comparing uh, scikit-learn um, and TensorFlow versus um, H204 GPU using k-means on uh, one through eight GPUs. And so here you can clearly see that it's just so fast. You're really not getting that great of an improvement by moving to eight GPUs. Um, but you know, it's still an interesting comparison of just looking at how long something takes you know, otherwise. And so taking this kind of progression of moving from uh, HDFS and MapReduce in its kind of primitive form and then moving to something like Spark in memory, the next thing we started doing was this combination of GPU um, and Spark, where we would do something and then write it back to system memory, do something else, write it back to system memory. And while this was useful, it still didn't really solve some of the challenges that we were seeing. Um, and so there's a bunch of different GPU accelerated technologies. There's Anaconda, who does a lot of work with Numba um, and, and Dask and other things, H2O, as I mentioned, uh, MapD, BlazingDB on the database side. And then there's a bunch of uh, graph, um, GPU accelerated engines like Gunrock, NVGraph, um, and Graph History. But one of the troubles that we had when we originally started this um, was moving data. And so if I wanted to do something in MapD and move that data to graph history, I would first have to go through um, and copy and convert the data back to system memory, do another copy and conversion to a different format, and then copy and convert it back onto the GPU before graph history could use the data. And so you have these two systems that are really fast. So MapD you know, doing things you know, orders of magnitude faster than Spark, graph history doing these large scale graph visualizations um, much faster than something like Gephi or Multigo, but the communication was the biggest bottleneck. And so what we want to do is kind of remove all of these things. And so once you move something to GPU, it can primarily just stay there. And then you do all your computation, and then you move it back once you're done. And so given that, there was also this movement on the open source uh, big data side with Apache Arrow. And so Apache Arrow really became this common data layer. Um, and its goal was to move basically from the left image to the right image. On the left, you had all of these copy and converts and everything um, you know, had to have a way to communicate with all these other different systems, where it said, let's just pick one standard for everyone, and then we can uh, just make data movement and data processing a lot easier. And so not only were they thinking about this from just a system perspective, also a language perspective. So Apache Arrow, it has Java bindings, C++ bindings, Go bindings, um, and there are new bindings getting created every day for Apache Arrow. And so with Apache Arrow, um, on the GPU side, we decided to basically leverage Apache Arrow uh, as fully as possible for the GPU. And basically having a subset of um, Arrow on GPU, the GPU data frame became this kind of common layer for us to pass data between different applications. And so now what we're seeing is once we leave things in GPU memory the whole time, um, we're getting a lot of a, a, a bigger improvement um, versus Spark. And so this is really useful when you start thinking about these user-defined functions. Um, let's say I have a workload, but there's one part of it that's just very intensive, and I want to move that whole, uh, that whole section. Instead of doing one function and then moving it back, and doing another function and then moving it back, and then doing a third function and moving it back, we can then just write a UDF that would just do and execute all these different functions and then move it back once it's done. And so the GPU Open Analytics Initiative really formed around this idea of how do we enable this end-to-end -end GPU computing um, to do these more complex things without going back and forth between system memory. And so initially, uh, we created a library called libgdf, um, which is mainly just all the C++ primitives for um, the GDF, and then pygdf and dasgdf are um, Python libraries on top of it. So pygdf is where we have a lot of our, our Python function um, that interfaces to libgdf on one GPU, and dasgdf scales that across multiple GPUs, multiple nodes. And once again, these projects are actively being worked on. Um, and so uh, I, I always tell people, this is a very young open source community that literally was formed um, in idea less than a year ago. Um, and then the project itself is probably eight months old. And so we're actively, um, adding more functionality, um, 
basically fixing a lot of issues. So please, uh, try these things out, break them, file an issue. We'd love to hear how people are using it or what people's ideas are um, in regards to it. And so with that, the GoAI ecosystem formed so we can um, really allow this kind of end-to-end -end GPU computing. And one of the big things that we really want to make sure that people take away from this is um, arrow on system memory is the same arrow on GPU memory, even though we just call it a GDF. And what it allows us to do is not only have this interoperability between a set of hardware, so interoperability on GPU and interoperability on CPU, it allows us this ability to move data back and forth um, without paying this heavy conversion penalty. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith to talk more about um, Python GPU data frame. All right, is my mic active? Can everyone hear me? All right, cool. So thanks, Josh. Uh, so Python GPU data frame, PyGDF, as Josh said, it's the Python GPU data frame library. So you use it just as any other Python library, and it's kind of modeled to be as pandas-like as possible. So in the big data world, Apache Arrow, uh, there's the Py Arrow library, and that's kind of mainly focused right now on how do I do kind of the, how do I handle the data movement problem? How do I hand data between different processes, between different technologies? Uh, PyGDF is kind of tackling that same aspect, but we don't have the luxury of having things like Pandas, Spark, all these other technologies for actually doing the compute on top of it. So we're actually kind of building out a Pandas-like API to actually leverage the power of GPUs to do compute on top of it. And so basically, as you can see here, it's a one-liner to convert a Pandas data frame to a GPU data frame. And then once you have a GPU data frame, you get kind of a lot of your standard built-in functions that you'd expect with a Pandas data frame. So things like filtering based on just sign, kind of like a basic query, doing things like counts, any kind of aggregations on a column. And then it can actually also use Numba to build kind of more advanced user-defined functions. So in this, in this example, we're just doing something very simple as far as just multiplying a, essentially a column by a constant. Uh, but you can do more advanced things, and I'll talk about that more a little bit later. But this talk isn't just PyGDF GPU data frame. Let's talk about Apache Spark. So Apache Spark has kind of become the industry-leading cluster computing framework. And the big reason behind that is that it has a very easy-to-use consumable API that you can use kind of almost any popular language to interact with. So whether you're using Python, Scala, Java, R, or even just writing SQL, you can use Spark and kind of get advantage of distributed computing on top of Spark. But what's important to note is regardless of what language you're working with, as long as you're using the Spark API under the hood, it's basically those API calls are just getting translated into JVM code that's running in Scala under the hood. And so basically, PySpark is the, Py, the Python API for Spark. And so it has, it has almost like a pandas data frame-like feel where you can do things like selecting columns, reading data, some basic kind of column manipulation, et cetera, that's easy to use. But all of these functions, what's actually happening, if, if I call like a column plus one, it's actually executing that code in Scala, which is in the JVM behind the scenes. And so why that's important. If you're using just the straight Spark, PySpark Py API, you're not actually running any real Python except for your local code in your master. So everything that I showed in that previous example, that's happening in the JVM. And the only thing that's actually running in Python is my local code. But the problem is, say you can't just use Spark built in. Say you need to do something outside of the norm in a UDF. So for example, in here, we want to convert a, one of our columns, we want to convert it to uppercase. So say there isn't a built-in function for that, even though I'm sure there is for this case. Um, say there isn't a built-in function, you need to use a UDF or a mapping function. And so you can define these UDFs in whatever language you want. You can define them in Scala or Java or Python and then call them from whatever language. And so, and then also, aside from just UDFs, you can do map, flat map, kind of operations like that. And it's essentially the same as a UDF, where you can write them in Scala Java, call them from Python, or just write native Python that way. 
But what happens when you actually write a Python UDF in PySpark is that you have this new problem of needing to kind of handle data movement from the executor, uh, the cluster worker JVM processes into Python worker processes. So for example, in my string to uppercase, basically all of the data is actually being handled by my Python workers in this case, so I need to kind of copy the data back and forth between my Python workers. And so this is a problem because moving data out of the JVM and into Python efficiently is actually really hard. And so basically how the data movement is actually implemented in Spark is by essentially pickling data. So in the executor JVM process, it pickles data, sends it to the Python workers, which then have to unpickle it, do whatever execution they're gonna do, and then repickle it to send it back to the JVM process, which then has to unpickle it there. And so obviously this is super inefficient, and this bottlenecks your kind of your whole pipeline, but how badly does this actually bottleneck it? And uh, many people typically try to avoid this problem by writing their UDFs in Java or Scala so that you don't need to actually leave the JVM and then just calling that UDF from within Python, but that doesn't, kind of, that doesn't help us if we want to define our UDF using kind of known Python libraries and kind of where we're comfortable and where we can actually solve the problems that we're trying to solve. And so this bottleneck, so this is just a really simple example of essentially a UDF that's just adding one. Um, basically, you can see 91.8% of the time is actually spent in serializing and deserializing the data and essentially pickling and moving the data as opposed to actually doing the compute. And so this talk is about GPU accelerating PySpark UDF. And if we're spending 92% of our time in just serialization, deserialization, and moving data, we can't feed the GPUs fast enough to take advantage of kind of the computing power that they offer us. And so uh, welcome Spark 2.3 and PySpark 2.3, where Spark 2.3 was the first release that actually has Apache Arrow compatibility. And there's a simple config that you can set that tells it to essentially use Arrow under the hood. And so kind of some of the things that using Arrow within PySpark give you is it gives you a much more optimized pipeline to go from a Spark data frame to a Pandas data frame or vice versa. And then it also gives you Pandas UDFs. And so it gives you two different kinds of Pandas UDFs to start. It gives you the scalar Pandas UDF and a grouped map Pandas UDF. So the scalar Pandas UDF is essentially if you want to apply a function across a column in your Spark data frame. And basically what happens under the hood is that that's, that column in Spark gets converted into an arrow buffer, which then gets uh, passed in as a panda series, which is a very efficient operation. And then you can do whatever you want to that panda series, and then in your function you return a panda series of the same length, and then it uses arrow to push it back into Spark. For grouped map UDF, that's, that would be basically, say you wanted to define some kind of custom aggregation function where your typical ones like max, min, sum aren't cutting it, it's kind of pandas data frame in and pandas data frame out, and those you can, it can be any length, so you could use it. For example, to just do a per group apply this function, but I want to just return the whole group without actually aggregating, or you can build some kind of custom aggregation function as well. And so what's actually happening under the hood in these pandas UDFs is that rather than having to pickle and unpickle the data constantly on both sides, it's actually using Apache Arrow to send the data back and forth. And so within the executor JVM process, basically Spark has its row-based data format that gets converted in an efficient conversion process to Apache Arrow. Then that gets sent without any serialization or deserialization to the Python workers, which can do a zero, a zero copy to Pandas, and then basically the same thing back and then there's just that fast conversion from Arrow to the Spark row-based data format again. And so as we can see, kind of the same example, lambda x, x plus one, uh, we don't actually have that, we're not spending 92% of our time in, serializa in serialization. And so now kind of our data movement problems are resolved, and when we're kind of, when we're building out these UDFs, the bottleneck goes away from data movement, data serialization, back to our compute. And especially as we're doing more advanced UDFs, 
it's just going to show even more that, hey, I'm actually getting bottlenecked by what I'm doing within my UDF. And so now we can actually utilize GPUs to help with that respect. And so basically, because PyGDF is a one-liner to go from pandas, it makes it really easy to build GPU-accelerated UDFs. And so for example, a scalar pandas UDF, you can see here it's just a one-liner to go from V, which is this, uh, which is a pandas series, to a PyGDF series, do whatever kind of operations I want to do. So I'm just sticking with my plus one example here, and then go back to pandas. And then the same thing for the grouped map UDF, that basically I have a pandas data frame, one-liner to go to a PyGDF, and I can do whatever operations I want there, and then go back. And so, but what, what about more advanced operations? So the whole point of a UDF is I, whatever I'm trying to do doesn't fit within the typical Spark API, where things like column functions or just adding one doesn't really, like I wouldn't use a UDF for that. I would just define that within the Spark API and let kind of my executor JVM process handle that as efficiently as possible. And so when you think of UDFs, you think of, well, I need to do something a lot more advanced that isn't column function, and, but I want it to be efficient. And so with PyGDF, because it's GPU-based, uh, you, you could write your own CUDA kernel. You could essentially build a low-level custom function to do that. But you know what? Spark users, that, that, they don't want to do that. That's a non-starter for them. Uh, and basically, if you tell people you need to build low-level code to do that, they'll basically just not do it. And so thankfully, we have Numba. And so PyGDF actually has built-in convenience functions that use Numba to JIT compile CUDA kernels on the fly. And so what this means is you can essentially write really naive Python and feed it into one of these convenience functions, like apply rows or apply map. And there's also a third one, apply chunks, for example. And Numba will handle actually converting that very naive Python into a CUDA kernel that is optimized to run. And so essentially what we're doing here is GPU accelerated UDFs within Spark UDFs. And so kind of just to stick with the same example, what this looks like, for example, adding one, is that we can just define uh, this add one uh, function. And then basically we just call that with an apply map. And that automatically will JIT compile that add one function into a CUDA kernel and apply that. And so you get essentially, you'll get uh, parallelized vectorized execution within uh, as if it's like a CUDA kernel. And then you can do the same thing from the grouped map UDF side on pandas data frames. And so you can do apply rows, you feed it a function that essentially has an input, uh, has input columns and output columns, and then kind of rebuild your pandas data frame to spit it out. And so kind of what are some of the lessons that we learned in this process? is that GPU accelerated UDFs are really hard to do right. Um, the data needs to be large enough to utilize the GPU effectively. And so with Spark, the way these UDFs work is they execute per partition on your Spark data frame. And so you need your partition size to be large enough to utilize the GPU effectively, but not too large to actually exhaust the GPU memory. And so what we've seen is the sweet spot is typically between about a million uh, elements and 10 billion elements, depending on your data type and everything. Anything less than that, and it basically, you can't effectively utilize the GPU for compute, and the overhead in compiling kernels and launching the kernels just kind of eats away any optimization that you have. And typically above that, you'll end up running out of GPU memory during your execution. Uh, the other, well, another big lesson learned is that the work done on the GPU needs to be really substantial. Uh, so for example, in testing some of this, I tried just doing a, a fast Fourier transform, for example, in FFT. And essentially what I saw is that I was spending, I think, around 85% of my time in just copying the data back and forth on the GPU. And the actual execution of the FFT was so fast that I couldn't really get the benefit of GPU accelerating it because I was losing most of my time in the transfer back and forth between Pandas and PyGDF. And so essentially what you want is you need to do something that's heavyweight enough where having the extra compute on the GPU makes it worthwhile to spend that time to actually copy the Pandas data frame over to it. 
And then the last lesson, and so like, for example, something that we're thinking about is that uh, say you have some kind of like time series data that could be represented in a graph. You can group by a timestamp and then run a grouped, a grouped map UDF of some, some kind of graph algorithm like PageRank per grouping. And so if you imagine then basically you can build a time series of graph features uh, is a good example. And graph analytics is a very hard compute heavy problem. And then the last lesson is that PyGDF and LibGDF actually, as of now, depend on Arrow 0.7.1, while PySpark needs Arrow 0.8 plus. And so there's work in progress to update that dependency. Uh, that is my GitHub repo of where I ripped out the code that's kind of offending in it. If you want to check some things out, basically it's the CUDA IPC implementation to allow handing the GP data frame between processes. Uh, and so if you're looking for a workaround, you can go there. And so let's talk about some of the future work that we're doing in this space. So with PyGDF and LibGDF, one of the big things is we're working on optimizing join performance. And so uh, one of our great dev techs you can see here is working on essentially a hash-based join approach for the GPU data frames that's really working to optimize join performance. Uh, we're working on a GDF graph analytics library. So essentially, once you have a GPU data frame, it'll be as easy as essentially specifying, here is my source column, here's my destination column, these are property columns, and then you'll have a number of graph analytics libraries available to you. So things like page rank, breadth for a search, connected components, triangle counting, et cetera. Uh, PyGDF and LibGDF, we're working on expanding it away from single GPU to interconnected GPUs. So that means GPUs on the same socket or GPUs that are connected with NVLink. And then we're working on just kind of general performance improvements across the board. Some of the other things. So Numba and Kupai, uh, I believe uh, Sue presented yesterday on Numba and talked about how they're working with Kupai to try to unify their GPU backends uh, with the main purpose being to share an n-dimensional array implementation. And so that essentially between these different GPU array libraries, I can kind of hand uh, the arrays off without having to copy and convert and use, use an array from one library as if it's an array from the other library. And we're kind of hoping to get the additional GPU array libraries, so things like PyTorch and PyCUDA, to unify as well in the future. And then we're doing Dask GDF and Dask Kupai work. And so we're, we're kind of working on using Dask as the scale out method for these GPU data structures and using kind of Dask to give us things like a distributed GPU data frame and a distributed GPU and dimensional array. And then essentially extending Dask's Kubernetes integration as needed to, extent, to uh, support the full extent of Kubernetes GPU support. So that essentially, if you can launch a Dask cluster on Kubernetes, you can launch a GPU-enabled Dask cluster on Kubernetes. And so Dask GDF is in the early stages of development. There's the repo there. And Dask Kupai hasn't started quite yet. But if you're interested in working on it, come talk to us afterwards. We're hiring. And then just some things that I would love to see in Spark 2.3 and forward. Uh, I would love more Arrow-based Pandas UDF types. So one of the big ones that I would like is a partition pandas UDF, where Spark has things like map partitions and for each partitions as functions, where I'd love the ability to define a, hey, for each partition, I want you to run this UDF and use Arrow to move the partition to pandas. And I'd love for Spark to just kind of move in the direction of using Arrow as its primary data format under the hood. So right now, Spark data frame uses a row-based data structure, which isn't isn't the best for most feature engineering kind of workloads. And so right now, Spark takes advantage of columnar file formats and columnar data connections uh, by doing predicate push down and loading only the necessary columns from it. But once those are loaded, it loads it into a row-based data format and further operations there work on top of that row-based data format. Uh, and kind of one of the benefits of if they adopt Arrow is that as Arrow kind of continues to mature and gets additional features, like optimized com compute kernels, it kind of gives Spark a native path to reduce its reliance on the JVM and kind of gives, gives the path for native GPU acceleration in the future. 
And so that's kind of it. Join the revolution. Apache Arrow, the GPU data frame, they're all open source. So try to, try to use them today. Report issues, give pull requests, give any kind of feedback. Uh, anything helps. And so with that, we'll take questions.